consists of magnetic fields. So if we simply switch off the magnetic fields, we have a cloud of gas and nothing tells it back anymore. That means the atoms fall down into gravity like an apple, but also they move away from each other with the characteristic velocity. So therefore, if we would now simply look at a specific time, how big is the cloud that directly measures the atomic velocity, directly measures the temperature. And we can look at the cloud with laser light. If we shine laser light on it, some of the laser light gets scattered or gets absorbed, and then the cloud casts a shadow. So most of what we know about those gases is obtained by just analyzing those shadow pictures. Okay, I want to show you now the moment of discovery. I want to show you how Bose Einstein condensates were discovered, and I really show you data of an amazing quality. Those data were taken only the second night we observed Bose Einstein condensation in the lab. Let me just explain to you what you will observe. Uh, so we cooled the gas to a certain temperature, we took a shadow picture, and well, those atoms, they move out, they hit the walls of the vacuum chamber, okay, they've done their job, our pumps take care of them. But then, a few seconds later, we have a new puff of gas, laser cooling, evaporative cooling, but this time, we blow at them a little bit harder with our microwaves, and therefore the gas has lower temperature. Now we switch, off the, when we switch off the magnetic fields, the cloud expands, and we take a second picture. How does the second picture differ from the first picture? We have repeated the same cycle. The only difference is that the cloud is now a little bit colder. Colder means slower. Slower means the shadow is smaller, because the atoms expanded less in the same amount of time. So what I want to show you now is a series of successive cooling cycles where we, we are pretty close to Bose Einstein condensation. We go now down in steps. So what you observe is as we change how hard we blow at them with the microwave, you observe how the cloud shrinks, it gets colder. But it's not just getting colder. Suddenly there is a change in the characteristic. It looks like it's a cherry which has a pit inside. So this pit inside this this is the Bose Einstein condensate. These are the blue guys which march in lockstep. Let me just show it again. There's something else you should see. This shadow is perfectly circular, but what suddenly happens inside is elliptic. So something is going on here. Something is happening which shows that the character, the properties of the gas has changed. So let me just explain what you have seen here. Number one is, if the cloud gets smaller, smaller, and then there is a small pit inside. Though I hadn't explained to you so far that our magnetic containers are not round, they are elongated. It's just, it's easier with magnets to build elongated containers than to build round containers. But if you have an ordinary gas, everything moves in all directions, so it doesn't matter what the shape of the container is, after a long time of ballistic expansion, because everything moves in all directions, you get a perfect sphere. But the Bose-Einstein condensate, there is no random motion anymore. It's just one big wave. It feels the shape of the container, and this is showing up now when we release the atoms from the crack. Well, maybe some of you are disappointed. I said I showed you the coldest form of matter. I show you particles which march in lockstep. But what I've shown to you are so far only black ellipses. Well, this was how we discovered it. But then we said the next experiment would show, would should be, we truly want to show that atoms march in lockstep. So how do you show that atoms march in lockstep? Well, you want to show that they are coherent, that they form a single wave. So let me now explain how in physics we can show that something behaves as a wave. And let me first contrast it with something which does not show wave properties, namely red paint. If I take a balloon filled with red paint, a paintball, and throw it on a wall, I create a red spot. A second paintball creates another red spot. And if I aim well, you will find there is a region where red paint and red paint gives darker red paint. Very, very simple. 
But now do the experiment with a red laser beam. Take a second red laser beam, and then you will find something which is profoundly different. You will find an interference pattern, a pattern of fringes where darkness and brightness alternate. And what happens here is, uh, it is possible that light and light gives darkness because the positive and the negative electric field of the light can add up to zero. Or, if you go to the river, uh, to the Mississippi River and throw two stones into it, each stone creates a propagating, a traveling spherical wave. When the two waves come together, there is a standing wave. But a standing wave has nodes. These are points which are in absolute standstill. So what you realize here is motion and motion can add up to standstill because positive and negative velocities can add up to zero. So I think now you get the idea. Two laser beams, two stones, we need two Rosa Einstein condensates. Well, we had already one Rosa Einstein condensate and we, get, get, we got two. It's actually nearly as simple as I say it. We use a laser knife and cut a Rosa Einstein condensate into two pieces because a laser beam can repel atoms and literally cut the cloud into two. So now what we have is the following situation. We have two Bose Einstein condensates held in place by magnetic forces and by this laser beam, and then we switch everything off. That means that the atoms fall down due to gravity. That's what everything, everybody and everything does in gravitational potential. But now I didn't tell you about that. The atoms in the Bose Einstein condensate slightly repel each other. So the two clouds now penetrate into each other. And then we take it, illuminate it with a laser beam, and we take a shadow picture. And now we can address the question, do two clouds of gas behave like red paint, or do they behave like laser light? And what we observed was this. So, so this grayness and this noise simply comes because we can only use a tiny little bit of light. Uh, we can't, otherwise we would perturb the measurement. So this is pretty much outside the unobstructed laser beam, but here where the cloud is, the cloud absorbs light, so we see the shadow. But it has stripes, it is black, white, black, white. And where we see light here, this is where the light went through the cloud because there are no atoms. So what you see here is actually the equation that atoms and atoms can add up to nothing, but it's exactly the same as I told you about light and light and motion. So this nearly shows that atoms genuinely behave as just one big wave. So what I've told you so far is the story of the discovery of Rosa Einstein condensation and the first few experiments uh, done in 1995, 96, 97, and this and this is what was highlighted by the Nobel Prize Committee. The Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of Rosa Einstein condensates and for early experiments, and in particular this one experiment was seen. Now, when you go to Stockholm, well, it's the best party of your life. Uh, the Swedes have really perfectionized over 100 years. I was actually, I got my Nobel Prize at the century, at the century anniversary. It was 100 years, the 100th time the Nobel Prize was given. Uh, Anyway, they do wonderful honor to you. They set you up in the nicest hotel. You have a driver and a limousine for the whole week. You are invited to have dinner with the king and queen. But what is also very, very special is the Nobel Diploma is a piece of art. And this is my Nobel Diploma. And what it shows is the Bose Einstein condensate cut into two pieces with a laser beam. And the atoms in the Bose Einstein condensate, they are little bullets, they are particles. But they also have the wave nature shown here by those lines, and it is here where the wavy patterns come together. So this is the artist's rendering of the slide I've just shown you. How are we doing in time? Ten minutes? Okay, so I could stop the lecture here and would say, well, I took you down a memory lane and told you about uh, that excitement when those discoveries were made, but this was 95, 96, 97. I really want to show you now 
give you a taste of how the research has developed since then. But I also want to connect it with the original motivation we had, namely to discover new materials. Now, I've told you about the super properties of, of, of particles when they become Rosa Einstein condensate. And if you ask, maybe I can raise the question, what are the most important particles in our everyday life? Well, it's of course a trick question. You can say we have to breathe oxygen or things like that. But I would nominate the electron. Because the electron is what moves around in our computers. It's, it's what makes our uh, cell phones work. It's the electron which makes a difference if something is a conductor, a semiconductor, or an insulator. So a lot of the material properties, at least the solid state materials, is determined by the electrons. And therefore, it's maybe a natural question if the electrons are so important, can the Bose Einstein condense the electrons? Because then we had computers powered up by Bose Einstein condensates with new properties. Well, it's at that point I have to tell you the truth that uh, we have two kinds of particles in nature. We call them bosons and fermions. And to make the distinction simple, uh, in our everyday life, bosons and fermions can simply be distinguished by asking how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are inside. At least at low energy, unless you use accelerators and all that thing. Uh, everything consists in the world of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And so you can ask the question, how many constituents are inside? And there are only two possibilities, odd or even. If it's an odd number, we call the particle fermion. If it's an even number, we call it boson. And now by simply going with the name, uh, you realize it's only bosons which can both ions and condense. So only certain atoms, actually it's a majority of atoms, who have an even number of protons, electrons, and, and, and uh, neutrons inside. Now, bosons and fermions behave very, very differently. And this is wonderfully captured by a cartoon which was drawn by the sister of one of my graduates. So she wasn't a physicist, but her brother was a physicist, and now she was drawing this piece of research. And just look at that. I mean, look at the properties of fermions. I mean, these are losers. I mean, they are lonely. Each of the fermions going to be by itself. Uh, that would mean if we show different motion states, different energy levels as a staircase, each of them wants to be on his or her own step and have nothing to do with anybody else. Actually, if you recognize the principle of the periodic uh, table of elements, that's exactly it, or the Pauli exclusion principle. So I think the chemist should recognize how what electrons do. Just one electron per state. And life is involved. But now look at the bosons. They have fun. They are social. They are very different. What they love to do is go down to the lowest level, which is the lowest energy, form a bose einstein condensate, dance together, and that means being superfluid. So it's a dramatic difference. So the question is, is there something we can do to those users? Can we help the elements to And well, the answer is, well, we need an even number. What, what about if we would have electrons which form pairs? Pairs of electrons can both Einstein condensate and can show the property of superfluidity. So therefore, we have now to pair two fermionic particles with each other. And of course, when I said pairing, one could use an, an, an analogy between men and women. So superfluidity of fermions means they can't dance by themselves. It's a dance of pairs. But now there are two kinds of pairs. You know, there is this classic dance where you really see couples dancing like here. But then there is modern dance. You walk to a dance floor. You don't even see that couples are dancing. But if you look carefully, you recognize sometimes men and women look into their eyes and their motion is somewhat correlated. Then you realize there's still pairs dancing. And those two kinds of dances also take place in the world of physics. Two atoms can form a molecule, but two atoms can also stay far away from each other and just be in correlated motion. And when two atoms form a molecule, 
it's a very easy system. We can even forget that it's two particles, it just behaves like one particle, like one small molecule. But this correlated motion of two atoms is much more subtle, much more fragile, much more mysterious. But it is this subtle form of correlated motion which is responsible for superconductors. So if we want to understand superconductors, we have to understand the modern dance of the fermions. And there was something new we introduced to the field, and this is the possibility to have a molecule and eventually dissociate the molecule by simply changing the magnetic field. So we have, by using molecules close to the dissociation unit, the ability to have a molecule and then continuously make it bigger, make it very loosely bound until there is only some correlated motion. So for the first time in science we were able not just to do the classic dance, the modern dance, but to map out everything in between and connect these two different regimes. So in other words, by using magnetic field control, we allowed fermions to dance classically to the modern dance, and in between there is a form of dance which had not been observed before. So when we did the experiment, well, you already realized the black are the shadows, and when the shadows get a little, I get excited. So here, these are not Bose-Einstein condensates of atoms. These are now Bose-Einstein condensates of fermions which have I actually regard that work the most important work I've done beyond Bose-Einstein condensation. And this is now shedding some new light on how can electrons pair and form a superconductor. Let me just close in a few minutes to kind of give you some insight into the psyche of scientists. So, if you have realized the dance of couples, the dance of fermions who form pairs and become superfluid, what would you do next in your research? Well, the one thing we did next is, well, what happens if we have more men than women on the dance? You would say, why do you do that? Well, I can tell you, if you have an equal number of men and women, everybody is happy. But if you have an imbalance in population, there is frustration, and you can learn a hell of a lot about human nature. <laughs> <laughs> By putting together an unbalanced number of fermions in one state in another state, we can learn a hell of a lot about the stability of the superfluid state. So that's what we did. And we can immediately ask questions. What happens if there is an excess population, if there are a few extra men on the dance floor, does it spoil the whole dance and the dance stops? In other words, is superfluidity immediately quenched by imbalance? We found out that this is not the case. The second question you can ask, but what are these extra men doing? Sorry, at this point I break the gender into language, but you can reverse it if you want. Uh, so what are these extra men doing? Are they leaving the dance floor and watching the happy couples, or do they stay on the dance floor? In other words, I'm asking, is there phase separation between a superfluid and normal component? Phase separation like oil and vinegar, the two phases separate. And finally, this was the most exciting question, maybe there's a new, new kind of dance. Maybe suddenly the atomic particles dance in groups of three and not in groups of two, and then everybody would be happy again. However, this was, there were theoretical predictions, unfortunately, we didn't find this. But by just doing our experiment, by looking at those shadow pictures, you realize there are many more men than women. Here, there is no peak, there is no superfluidity, but here there is. So we found that the system is tolerant to quite a bit of mismatch in the population of the two kinds of fermions. Or here we use not shadow pictures, but another optical technique. You see the shell structure here. You see how white surrounds the gray. The white are the men, the grey are the happy couples. So really, in the ultra cold world, the men have to, work, have to walk to the edge of the dance floor, and in the middle, this is where the fun is based. So, I hope I gave you a little bit of taste what the research is, that we use ultra cold atoms in a quest to understand the theory of properties. But we are working here not just at ultra-low temperature, we are working also in a very dilute gas. And that means, compared to ordinary matter, we have magnified everything by a factor of 1,000. And that greatly simplifies the understanding and the analysis. 
Maybe I can explain the last point to you in the following way. If you want to develop new airplanes and you have a new idea, 